This video contains the contents of the Australian Hi-Fi magazine checkout cassette recorded by the publication on a 1982 Ampex Grandmaster 1 cassette. There are eight tracks or chapters on this cassette, each addressing a separate subject, and the subjects are as follows. Track 1, General Identification and Balance. Track 2, Speaker Phasing and Positioning. Track 3, Dolby Calibration. Track 4, Meter Calibration. Track 5, Resonance Checks. Track 6, System Frequency Response. Track 7, Mechanical Problems. And Track 8, Maintaining Your Recorder. Let's throw in a tape deck and listen to it. For this, I'm going to use the Yamaha KX380. This test cassette has been encoded for the Dolby Type B noise reduction system and is largely compatible with the ANRS system. It is not compatible with other systems and these should not be used. When playing this test cassette, the Dolby B or ANRS switch on your cassette deck should be on. If your deck is not fitted with either of these noise reduction systems, there will be no material effect on most of the tests. The music examples, however, may sound a little over bright, and this can be partially corrected by backing off the treble tone control on your amplifier. In all other cases, except for the pink noise test, the tone controls should be left at their flat positions. You should set the mode switch at stereo and the volume control at a normal, comfortable listening level unless otherwise told. The commentary on this cassette should enable you to carry out all the tests without any problems, particularly if you are an experienced audiophile, but we do suggest that you use the cassette in conjunction with the written notes, which in many cases contain extra helpful details. The tests are all designed to be used without any instruments other than your own ears and your cassette recorder's level meters. Track 1, Channel Identification and Balance. For this test, we use a 1 kHz tone recorded at a fairly high level, 3 dB below standard Dolby level, in fact, and we recommend that you keep your amplifier volume control at a low setting during the sequence to avoid speaker damage. The tone will appear first in the left channel and then in the right channel. This part of the test can also be used for checking channel separation. There should be little or no meter indication for the channel in which the tone is not recorded. And using your balance control as outlined in the notes, you can check the separation by ear. Lower your volume control now until both tones have been heard. Left channel. Right channel. For setting channel balance at the cassette deck, the 1 kHz tone is now recorded in both channels at exactly the same level. The exact procedure for this test will vary depending on the design of your cassette deck and you should refer to the printed notes. Remember that the actual meter indication also depends on cassette deck design, but it should be 3 dB below the Dolby calibration mark on the meter scales. This test can be affected by Dolby calibration, for which a special track is included later in this cassette. You should now lower your volume control again.
should now raise your volume control again to the normal listening level. We are now going to use a short musical example to allow you to set overall system balance using the balance control on your amplifier. The music has been recorded monophonically and should appear to come from a point midway between your two speakers from your normal listening position. Adjust the balance control until this condition has been achieved. If you have any trouble locating the central sound image, move on to the next part of this cassette which will probably help solve the problem. Track 2, Speaker Phasing and Positioning. In a stereo system, the two loudspeakers must be in phase, that is, working together instead of fighting each other, if a proper stereo image and musical balance is to be achieved. A fuller explanation is given in the accompanying notes. The test is simple, and will use the same music that you heard in the last test. The music is recorded again monophonically, and has been chosen because of its bass and percussive content which makes central image location much easier. If your speakers are in phase, the music will appear to come from that same fixed point midway between your speakers, and there should be a solid bass content. Have a listen. We're now going to play that same piece of music again, but this time we've recorded it for the channels out of phase. It should sound thinner with a less solid bass line, and it should be difficult to locate the central image. The apparent sound source should be diffuse and hard to pinpoint. If your speakers are in phase, the first example should have sounded fine with a firm central image. If, however, it sounded like that the second time, when the music was deliberately recorded out of phase, your speakers are incorrectly connected. This is easily fixed. Just reverse the connections to one speaker only, and replay the section again to check. And just to refresh your memory, is the music once again recorded in phase? Now that you know that your speakers are correctly phased, you should check their physical position in the room, which is just as important for achieving a good stereo image. Check the notes, which will give you some guidance. As a test, my voice is now going to be recorded so that it will appear at five different positions across the stereo stage. As you sit facing your loudspeaker, my voice will be coming only from the left-hand speaker. But now we'll move things a little and so that my voice will seem to come from a point to the left of centre, as it should be now. And so we move again, this time so that my voice will come from the middle of the stereo stage, that central image again. If everything is correct, my voice will now be coming from a point to the left of your right-hand speaker. And finally, from the right-hand speaker only. That's from the extreme right. Back now to the middle. You'll notice that a stereo system, when properly set up, is capable of pinpointing an apparent sound source anywhere between your two speakers. If you found location difficult, consult the notes about speaker positioning and then play this track again. When you've done that, have a listen to the next musical example, during which you should be able to locate instruments right across the stereo stage, not just from the two speakers and the middle. <laughs>
Track 3, Dolby Calibration. If your cassette deck is not fitted with a Dolby B or ANRS system, you can skip this track and go on to the next one. For the Dolby system to function correctly, it is essential that it be calibrated, and this is achieved with tones recorded at the standard and proper levels. If your deck has user accessible calibration controls, use them in conjunction with the following test tones to calibrate according to the manufacturer's instructions. Note how close the meter reading is to the Dolby calibration marks as outlined in the notes. One decibel or one division either way need not cause any concern. If the variation is more than this, and if there are no calibration controls, we suggest that you contact your dealer to have it properly aligned. This test can also be used for ANRS calibration. During the tone which follows, you should turn your amplifier's volume control down as it has been recorded at a high level. The frequency is 400 Hz at the standard level on both tracks. It lasts for a full minute to give you plenty of time for adjustments without having to keep rewinding. Turn your volume control down now. That concludes the Dolby calibration tone. You may return your volume control to normal. Track 4. Meter calibration. Many cassette decks are fitted with what are labelled VU meters. The following test will enable you to check exactly how close to true VU meters they in fact are. The test starts with a 1 kHz tone recorded at our standard reference level which should give a meter indication close to 0 dB. Then follows a series of tone bursts recorded at the same level. The frequency is still 1 kHz, the repetition rate is 1 per second, and the duration is 300 milliseconds. Refer to the notes for detailed instructions on the interpretation of this test and how to use it in setting recording levels. As the tones are recorded at a high level, you should lower your volume control until the test is finished. Lower the volume control now. You may now raise your volume control to normal. Track 5, Resonance Checks. In this test, a gliding frequency response tone is used from 15 kHz down to 50 Hz. Because of limitations in the cassette recording medium, it has been recorded monophonically at a comparatively low level, and you may see no movement on your DEX meters at all. And because of the low level, you may want to raise your volume control slightly. However, beware of overloading your speakers. Listen for any buzzing or distortion from them, which might be signs of imminent damage. Throughout the test, listen for vibrations, either from the speakers or from something in the room. If you hear any, and you're sure it's not because the speakers are being overloaded, play the gliding tone again and again until you locate the source of the problem. Don't be confused by standing waves in your room, They'll sound quite different from resonant vibrations and can cause sudden increases or decreases in the apparent volume of the tone. They can be identified distinctly from vibrations as outlined in the notes. For ease of identification, there will be voice announcements at specific frequencies during the glide tone. 
You will find advice in the notes on how to get rid of some of the problems you find. You may now raise your volume control. Fifteen kilohertz. Ten kilohertz. Five kilohertz. Two point five kilohertz. One kilohertz. Eight hundred and fifty hertz. Two hundred and fifty hertz. One hundred and fifty hertz. One hundred and twenty five hertz. Hertz. Fifty hertz. That ends the glide tone test. Return your volume control to normal. Track 6, System Frequency Response. This track is designed to enable you to use your tone controls or a graphic equalizer to set your system, including the listening room, for the flattest possible frequency response. It uses narrow bands of pink noise with center frequencies ranging from 10 kHz to 50 Hz. Each tone is recorded twice with a 1 kHz reference tone in the middle. As outlined in the notes, the level of the 1 kHz band is adjusted according to the Fletcher-Munson curves 
to account for changes in the ear's response at different frequencies. Use your tone controls to make the high frequency band sound as loud as the 1 kilohertz band. Don't attempt to make all the high frequency bands sound as loud as each other. That's not the point of the test. Refer to the notes for a more detailed explanation. As the tones are recorded at a low level, there will probably be no meter indication, and you may wish to raise your volume control slightly. For identification, there will be voice announcements at the start of each band. Raise your volume control now. Ten kilohertz. Eight kilohertz. Six kilohertz. Four kilohertz. Two point five kilohertz. Two kilohertz. One point five kilohertz, seven hundred and fifty hertz, five hundred hertz. Three hundred and seventy five hertz, two hundred and fifty hertz, two hundred hertz. Twenty-five hertz. One hundred hertz. Fifty hertz. You should now lower your volume control to normal. Track 7. Mechanical problems. If your deck is new and in good condition, you should not have any mechanical problems such as wow or flutter. But as the recorder gets older, the faults can creep up on you slowly and be difficult to recognise. We're going to provide some exaggerated examples of wow and flutter to help. The best way of detecting wow and flutter is with slow piano music, and we've recorded an example without any artificially induced problems. Now for an example with a rather large wow content. A wow is simply a fairly long term speed variation. 
if your deck doesn't have any wow, at least you'll know what it sounds like if your deck is wowing this example might help you recognize it by its exaggeration Sounds terrible, doesn't it? Wow can be caused by a number of things, including a worn drive belt, seized bearings, or even dirty, sticky heads. But it can also be caused, as can flutter, by a faulty cassette. So if you hear the problem on a cassette, play a few different ones to check. Obviously, you should always use the best quality cassettes, regardless of which tape type you use. That way you'll minimize any problems. If you can't correct the problem after reference to the accompanying notes, take your machine in for service. The same advice, of course, applies to flutter, which is caused by shorter-term speed variations. It can be caused by a cassette, but is more likely to be caused by a damaged or worn capstan or idler wheel. Here's an exaggerated example. Notice how the music gets a harsh, rough quality with the flutter introduced. Another problem you might run across is a recorder running fast or slow. Unless the speed error is extreme, you won't notice it, unless you have perfect pitch, and small errors are not very important. If you can hear problems, a visit to a service center is the only cure, although it could be a faulty cassette. Track 8. Maintaining your recorder. There are some basic things you have to do to make sure that your cassette deck remains in the best possible working order. You should find most of them mentioned in your owner's manual, but we're going to include a couple of examples of things that can happen if you don't follow the instructions. The first and most obvious thing is the need to keep the tape heads clean. Remember that music we played earlier? It sounds okay. But with dirty heads, you can lose all the high frequency response so that it sounds like this. Remember, though, that this problem can also be caused by misalignment of the tape head. You can get another problem called dropout. This can also be caused by using cheap tape, but dirty or worn heads can lead to erratic contact between the heads and the tape. And that sounds like this. If you hear any of these problems, clean the heads, capstan and idler wheel using any of the products available for the purpose. If that doesn't cure the trouble, your deck is obviously scheduled for a visit to the service center. Demagnetization of the tape heads on a regular basis is vital. If you don't do it, the high frequencies on your valuable tapes will be gradually erased and recordings will become noisy with a lot of hiss. In an extreme case, it could sound as bad as this. There's one more noise we might point out, and that's mains hum. You're listening to an example of it right now. It's caused usually by an earth loop somewhere in your system, and you'll find some advice on how to get rid of it in the notes. Well, that should cover the main problems that you're likely to come up against. If you use the musical examples and the test tones on this cassette, you should be able to set up your cassette deck and system perfectly. So, as a final example, here's that rather spectacular piece of music again, which, as you'll find outlined in the notes, you can use to repeat some of the tests.
hope that wasn't too boring thanks for watching and see you next or the previous video